a real pleasure for me today to be able to introduce uh, Peter Killeen. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, Peter was one of my first mentors when I was a getting graduate student and he was a beginning assistant professor at Arizona State University, so it's especially nice to be able to to uh, pay some homage to him for whatever he did to make me what I am. He gets uh, all the credit and none of the blame for the way I am. Uh, some of you might find it hard to believe actually comparing our relative appearances that he was the mentor. Uh, there are two hypotheses that you're allowed to entertain for that. One is that he was 12 when he was an assistant <laughs> professor. Or two, that it's better to live in Arizona than it is to live in Florida. <laughs> I'm introducing Peter's a little difficult this year because a, an absolutely wonderful introduction to his background is provided by him in the program book. And uh, I recommend it as the, the main must read in the program book this year. If you haven't looked at uh, Peter's description of, of his path, his academic path, then you really should. As I said, we both uh, we met initially at uh, Arizona State back in, uh, whenever that was, some years ago was known as Fort Skinner in the desert, correctly. <laughs> and, uh, but before that time, uh, Peter's intro in the, in the program book sort of begins with his academic career at Arizona State. Uh, before that time, it's my understanding that he was, uh, his academic pedigree included uh, studying the study of things inanimate, but that apparently wasn't fully satisfying. And so he, his career veered into the study of the animate. Uh, I like to use the word animate because it allows me to plug a paper of his that I don't think has received its due. It's called Mechanics of the Animate. Uh, you can find it in the JF archive. It's especially useful if you're a young person trying to figure out what to do. It essentially lays out a research agenda of the experimental analysis of behavior in a, in a very uh, compelling way. So I, I highly recommend it. In the title of his talk here, it, that's not a typographical error. It really is the law of affect. Uh, Peter is uh, following on uh, Thorndike's views, which I think reinforces for me the idea that uh, ideas in psychology uh, are never refuted. Uh, they often go into hibernation, but I think uh, Peter is going to wake us up about uh, Thorndike's views. Now, apropos of his talk, I think uh, I get uh, considerable satisfaction out of being able to Peter, and I'm sure that we'll all be uh, satisfied with his presentation. Uh, it remains to be seen, however, if the frequency of our attending his talks increases in the future. So with that, I'm just Peter Klein. First of all, it is a, um, 
a lot about the three-term contingency, about how reinforcement makes responses that are occurring in a situation more likely to recur. The second thing to know about it is that it's probabilistic. It's only more likely to recur. And then the third thing to notice about it is that in the last sentence is a weak version of the law of effect. <coughs> the integrated effects of reinforcement. Paul Chance said this is the year of our origin. That Skinner's, that Thorndike's puzzle boxes became Skinner's Skinner boxes, and that the just as uh, as Watson used Pavlov's conditioning as his clue, Thorndike <coughs> Skinner used Thorndike's law of effect as his law of effect after he sanitized and rematched it. Many of us know that well, it's a problem with the way he stated it because it, it relies on subjective states of affairs that were not correctly proven. Thorndike recognized that was a problem. He wasn't interested in just talking about a field of organism. He immediately, after the law you read, said, well, we need to go further and clarify our definition. By a satisfying state of affairs, we mean things that the animal will do nothing to avoid, often working to obtain or to maintain that situation. And not only did he give an operational definition of satisfiers as things an animal's approach, but he also gave a functional one. He said, we can't do this with precision beforehand. He said that food for a hungry person, rest for a fatigued one, society for a lonesome person are often the often occurrences of reinforcers of satisfiers. But we have to look at each organism and watch what they do. So this is a pretty good, not too far from what we're doing. During the next 40 years, Skinner's worked out his own position on the law of effect and summarized it in an in-your-face paper the title of the paper was written in your face, as is his warrant. Are theories of learning necessary? That was the main game at the time. Um, and his platform was to avoid subjective states. Um, Cold force, the term comes from the mechanical philosophers at the time of Newton, who revolted against hypostatizing forces that were circular, that couldn't be seen, and they just got the job done. And Skinner picked up on it. I don't know if he read it, but he read Molière, who made fun of the soporific principle, which was invoked to explain why certain things would be sweet, like some perhaps. Um, and Newton had problems. After he denied uh, cult forces, he came up with a worldview that included gravity, which is the mother of all cult forces. And so right away, he spin doctor and said, uh, I, he said, I don't pose hypotheses. Gravity is not a hypothesis. It's a true cause. Just as he had to spin doctor his position, Skinner, um, first of all, identified the law of effect, not the satisfiers, but re reinforcers. And he, he, he sort of took a shortcut along uh, across the subjective uh, states. But then he had this problem of, well, behavior doesn't always occur. And so how, how can we deal with it? We deal with defining the satisfiers and, and state consequences. How do we deal with non-regular occurrence of behavior? Well, he left it up to chance. He, he invoked the emitted elicited distinction. It says, sometimes it's like that. Don't ask me to explain it. Documents are emitted. And so he, he felt then free of uh, filling in with the two causes, uh, the, the understory of why behavior uh, Newton, uh, gravity is no hypothesis. Skinner, the law of effect is no theory. Nixon and I know. <laughs> it is no theory. It specifies the procedure for altering the probability of the chosen response. Well, that's not what a law is. A law is not a procedure. Next time you write a JF article, try substituting in your procedure section for law. <laughs> it's not what, uh, this is the kind of thing that laws are. No, or it fits massive gas, product of pressure line to the constant. So, Skinner's, um, okay, I'll come back to that. Um, he went on to talk about probability as a key variable, and then went on beyond that to say, rate of responding is not a measure. He liked to use quotes because that led him to how he's getting to do. It's not a measure of probability, but it's the only appropriate datum in the formulation in these terms. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. All right. I don't know what that means. Uh, but don't not not to worry about it because once you have an effective data like response rate is talking about, we may 
we feel little need for any theoretical constructs. We don't need your state theory when we can control weight. Um, so this is his argument. Once we 
now, he said, we don't need to talk about probability anymore. And we had theoretical constructs as he did so brilliantly in his laws. So the situation now has evolved from a satisfier increasing the rate of large or gold responses to now an increasing the proportion to the reinforcers that you have with the backdrop of other reinforcers. So to summarize so far, um, Skinner abandoned prior to the constructs to focus on generating behavior. Skinner reintroduced theoretical constructs to work here. Uh, <clears throat> Skinner abandoned laws for procedures. Skinner formulates one of the most powerful laws in psychology. Uh, they both adapted Pavlov's learning as uh, uh, strengthening over Thorndike's selecting and connecting. Although Skinner, of course, came back to selecting later on. They both recognized probability as the key measure of strength that they wanted to work with. Um, they substituted laws. It's out of order, sorry about that. Uh, Skinner substituted response rate for probability, and Ernstein relative response rate for probability. They both focused on performance. Uh, acquisition. Skinner demonstrated great ability to control behavior gen as in generally generate control response rates as an alternative to the constructs and Bernstein beautiful ability to account for response rate that's here. So we have Skinner generating the technology of behavior, but not really moving us along the theory. And then opening the door for the rest of us and Einstein's kept who had really I think got the field going as a theoretical enterprise. Then, uh, at about the same time, uh, Howie and Billy Snowden saw shoulders of these two giants, and I think saw a little bit farther uh, two key uh, arguments in that paper that the, the dependent variable is not a relative response rate. Well, the Einstein color rate is relative response number. But we should consider choice as time allocation as a positive rate. And the argument that behavior should be predicted in terms of relative values of activity. Now, relative values of activity sounds a lot like relative satisfaction that you get out of these activities. Uh, in both cases, it was a fairly well-defined construct in terms of independent variables and in terms of activities and how you measure it. So we see that, and I'll be coming back to both of these insights because they'll play a role in modern versions of the law of effect. Well, Thorndike's law of effect is about learning. Everything we've been looking at has been the laws of performance, not learning. And Tony uh, put dynamics back into the world that uh, he, he noted that persistence as well, we might want to say acquisition, but the rate response rate choice and, and persistence are important. Um, Hertzstein's got, uh, got relative rates covered, especially when you generalize. It's curious, you can't get from Hertzstein's law of effect to bounds and maybe it's great empirical work with it directly, but inspired it. Uh, and then Tony offers momentum theory for the dynamics of behavior when it's disrupted and with help extended it to uh, uh, choice behavior. His theory is talks about persistence that depends on the rate of reinforcement in the context, the function of that, relative changes in behavior measures relative persistence, and the branding uh, is an extended to cover choice. So this is a prism, and you can get from one uh, measure preference to another resistance by just going around the corners of this prism. And here are some data uh, on the 97 paper we put showing that you can change your independent variables and dependent variables that you got. That's always the case with level, levels of the details, that's why I'm not dwelling on the details. Uh, Matt Bell talked about a few of them, Franz Bachmann talked about differences in how you conceptualize um, disruption. But the stories coming together, all sciences are details uh, where the devil works, but um, the story is showing. This theory is a little bit like mine, uh, with inertial behavior being equivalent to that specific activation, with behavioral momentum being comparable to my arousal well, The uh, they did a kink, the kink, the Einstein complicated function with power function. I did it by um, constraints on responding, <coughs> responding under time constraints, and you look and get those kinds of So there we have performance tied to persistence. 
So here's a good course for our audience before we get into the modern history. Okay, we're moving the law of the crack now. It's really a bunch of propositions you can't deny, I want to say. Now, if you've ever fed a dog, you notice how hard it is to keep them away from the food fish when they're filming. Okay, that's all this is about. Okay. Animals are But if you need citations, as you usually do when you write a paper, that's another part of the tutorial sites of old death clubs. You know, uh, praise, no, I don't have the words, but I'll try to remember what they said. Uh, all instincts uh, are, have a flaw of being repetitive and avoidance nature and are directed at things and animals and discharge the instinct. All that, the facts of abundance and abundance are so ubiquitous that you can't miss them, you can't overlook them. Schneer that all, um, the, the one universal commonality amongst all uh, instinctive behavior is approaching the flaw. Hence, the final tendency in animals is to move towards Think the heroes they need to satisfy the final instincts. The devil also comes out of the loop of special things. And even poets recognize the truthfulness of um, <laughs> law of attraction. And, and politicians, of course, when they see a good thing, they get into the act and proclaim not only uh, can we approach happiness, but we have an inalienable right to pursue happiness. And so um, if you need data, we have Brown versus Jenkins sign back. I don't know how much more data you need. A whole zoo full of animals who approach reinforcers or science reinforcers. Uh, in fact, it's squid pro club. Cuttlefish do it too. So you have this rate, you could say you have a rate, and I won't get into it here. First burger family can't train chicks to run away from food to get food to come with you to become a kid pop and kind of experiment with you. Ruminate problems. We have John Rader Platt's notion of behavioral differences and behavioral bridges. Um, this notion of approach implies almost a kind of gradient. Uh, it's an interesting question. Is it really required? I don't know. I don't know. The next key claim of the law of attraction, I argue, is more fundamental than the law of attraction because, boom, you see it right there. Um, that satisfies the context of higher rates of reinforcement relative to the animal's current state or reinforces associated with more attractive or more satisfying, more valuable uh, state. A lot of people have given lip service to this. Uh, Temple Difference model of Diane uh, Bardo, uh, Sutton Bardo, is really about fat chain. Uh, the Ray Hurst and Jenkins long box experiment where you have tension between attraction to a goal and signs of reinforcement to stretch it long enough that the little man to get pop. Holly is showing that as stimuli the closer and closer to the temporal locus of reinforcement, animals are more attracted to pet effort to respond to them. So you do have this kind of breathing effect. Wasserman and Hurst set up a box uh, where the animal could move around it and found the animals got close to signs that were temporally associated with reinforcement and farther away from ones that were removed from reinforcement. And they were able to cluster CSs around before and after the US and they found that the closer the, the, the uh, CS is were to the U.S. in time, the more the animals would approach them, the farther away they were, the more they would back away from them. So it's a lovely temporal, physical temporal gradient. Uh, to do with instrumental behavior, Lau has a lovely uh, set of graphs showing the interaction of wavelength through time. So you have this multi-dimensional gradient through time, through stimuli, that animals shift down for satisfaction. Next claim. Satisfying contests support actions and states. Both the models are at lower potential, higher attractiveness, and the behavioral system. This is built in relates to the behavioral system. The system is so system both models and brain. Now I want you to do a shepherd experiment and rotate that in 90 degrees counterclockwise or in like clockwise. Get that. So animals in the predatory mode, where they could be in a defensive mode or uh, uh, sexual mode, will go into a number of uh, systems, go to a number of modes that in, in, in which a number of the agents are concerned. My claim is that moving down this gradient is what constitutes reinforcement in the general case. Going 
from traveling. If traveling lets you get to something that you can investigate where that problem is reinforced. If investigating lets you get to something you can chase, then that kind of investigation is reinforced. So reinforcement is about moving down through these um, modules. Tori Higgins is a really good my social psychologist on regulatory fit. And by that, he means organisms can be one of several of Timber Lake's uh, systems or substances, organisms that refer to Timber Lake. If you're in a promotion focus, messages about getting things work really much more effective than messages about protecting yourselves from things. And if you get people in the promotion focus, just you know, by, by setting the stage with a couple words, or get them in the prevention focus, and then messages about risk and danger work much more effectively if you're in the prevention focus than an approach. So even people, not just pigeons and squid, can go to these different states, and when they're in the cities, uh, you can differentiate. You can measure approach and avoidance by flexion and tension in the arm. And if you do that, you find that you can measure gradients that way. You can use these on that. We you measure steeper gradients in one than the other if you have the appropriate kind of the loss of avoidance in the prevention focus or gain in the promotion focus. So this stuff generalizes even the people. Um, in, in the sense of these systems, if, if you're, if, let's say if, you, uh, if your partner is in the, if you, if you want to get in the uh, amatory mode and your partner is in the defensive mode or the predatory mode, you're, you're just not going to get to the kind of action you want. You have to set the stage in order to make this treatment to see it be more appropriate for the years to figure that out. There are a lot of other uh, field theories that, that are pretty good uh, to embody these concepts. So, um, efficient routes to these things of lower potential. What does efficient mean? Does it mean at least effort? Now, just standing here uses a lot of calories. And pressing levers once I'm standing contributes minuscule to this. My calories is the wrong word. I was talking with Paul Coyne about this, and he suggested, well, how about the law of least time? The law of least time is that paths through behavior space that minimize time to improve states are very best, frankly, most, and preferred. Seems obvious. So, life is pure. It's toward satisfying. It's kind of a positive act that really did this long ago. What do you say? Maybe it's a behavioral change. And it's, um, Session of situations from lower to higher value satisfaction, attractiveness, and attention. Instrumental behavior can be used to move in the organs and through chains of situations. We find reinforcement is a great organization. I didn't pay attention to this when I read it, and many of you didn't either, but I think it was right on. It's fact dependent. It's very hard to go back. Um, you, can't, you can't shortcut around these states along the way. Before you come to it, you have to catch it. It's hard to go home again. It's hard to, the journey has momentum in itself. Even reading that slide, you're a little bit bothered, possibly, by being precluded from reading another set of dumb bullet points on the PowerPoint. Because they were there, and now they're blocked. Journeys have momentum. Interruption of the journeys is annoying. Uh, Thorndike said that. He said that um, when animals, and James did too, how did it go for James? Uh, any action which is habitually uh, made has very little pleasure or pain associated with it. But you interrupt, you arrest that, and all of a sudden pleasure and pain come to bear. For instance, breathing, you don't think much about it until asthma hits you. And then the agitation and pain of interrupting a standard procedure is when reinforcement comes into play. So journeys are regulated. Here's the regulation that James Timberlake, Alice, and Hanson developed, arguing that these states, because they have momentum, deviation from them will bring the animal back to do what it can to engage in them. And so by definition, then, the states are regulated. Um, nice work of Theodore um, Field and Rackman on giving an animal opportunity to engage in two concurrent offerings. And they have to, although the, you could argue they really should be always working on it response initiated that by, it's always available. Once they start responding on the um, RI schedule, the probability of leaving it over time increases. So here you have a scenario where the animals, for one reason or other, are on a random schedule, always have available what's really a better FI schedule. 
And they'll sometimes switch to it. The longer they're on the RI, the longer they stay on the RI. So the behavior has momentum. Once you get into one of these states, the animal keeps engaging in these things. In any case, I uh, a bunch of people who's working now, uh, very just classic work on animals responding for food in the presence of free food blew my mind when I first read it. Um, the uh, Kentucky group um, doing all of these experiments, I hated at first because they were so non-standard in showing that uh, animals prefer uh, not to work hard for things, but they prefer any of these other associated scenarios where they have worked hard. And the amazing stuff we're talking about today about uh, the transitions between states and the Indo contrast are really really important and not the absolute levels. So I'll make a Marsh doing an experiment, by example, of uh, Adam Navarro and Pantino with some cost effect. But a lot of stories have come around now, making the case that the human has been acting, not just villains. Um, so that's what we're hearing that this disruption is an annoyer, and turn by its exact words, has momentum and tonies, making this is regulated, social, and behavioral. Uh, with James said, around all of our actions to the habitual possibilities of measure and pain that are brought to bear in these actions are exploding. And that is bad sort of Marking, we know this too, again, a strange result by Lieberman about marking the response. Powerful effect, Ben Williams did a really nice model of the um, Marking the response makes a huge difference. Reinforcer does too, pretty good or bad. Uh, goal setting is one of the most highly cited things in organization. Goals that are difficult, clear, well specified, and motivated behavior much better. So we have momentum, we have market. What are some essence? Well, transitions to a better state of affairs. Not necessarily overall global, but locally. But from something that's not so good to something better, what constitutes the reinforcer. And then Ellen and I am trying to one that's an advantage, disadvantage to advantage. Pairing with primary importance. Reinforcement on the stimulus is important, but that the mother paper of Davis and Madam last year showed, I think quite conclusively, it's either necessary sufficient for a pairing to establish a condition of reinforcement. They have to be predictive. They have to get the animal either into a better state or give it information on how to get into a better state. It's pretty complicated what a condition of reinforcement is. Discrimination learning, like all learning, is approaching to reinforce stimulus. See the future positive or negative effect. If you have clips that animals can approach uh, that are S pluses, it is much more effective than in missing features. And then long ago, uh, there was studies of vicarious trial and error on a lack of learning and discrimination. We look down each side of the alley, sort of doing a SD's kind of stimulus sample until it finally decided, finally went one way or another. Argument could be that what it's doing is looking around for this stimulus that will get it over the threshold to the approach. Lambert says some beautiful research in body cognition kind of things. Just one of many good examples. If you give a person a question, the answer of which requires asking whether there are one or two chandeliers in here, and the correct answer is up on the panel, um, it'll be much quicker and more accurate than if the correct answer is below. Stuff. Whereas if you're asking the floor is chattered without the person even having to look down, there's no, it's a story that you're going to Their response is much quicker the response is low rather than high. This is mapping between discriminative stimuli, where they are in the environment, reinforces where they are, and the emotions you usually make together. And they play an important part of the world. So what's awkward to do? Well, it's awkward behavior is very simple. In a rat the lever box where it has to press the lever, on the lever is a sign of reinforcement. So how does it approach a flaw on the lever? Turn it to the context in which there's a flaw on the lever. It creates the discriminative stimulus that it approaches by putting this flaw on the lever. So I view all behavior as approach to stimulus. <coughs> or approach to and when the behavior is occurring, it will occur in doubts. These modules that we've been talking about, and they're, they're long run hit the survivor plot. Uh, survivor's plot, great show on students. I've shown that there's, um, if you find the, uh, on, on the, you find survivor plots are not good, you find they constituted a bunch of behavior occurring high frequency and long low frequency ones. That could be 
thought of as engaging in moving into a battle of response and then moving out disengaging and doing other kinds of things. Now, Michael Davidson points out the wrinkles in this, but I think that's just the problem with age. Um, there are some wrinkles, again, devils in the details. But first order of business here is moving into space and out of space. And the moving into space is reinforcing. They do talk to show that resistance to change of overall response rate is correlated with resistance to change of valve initiation rate of the mouth of the response. And once you're in a valve, uh, then you're, uh, the issues of momentum and resistance to change may not be so relevant, but yet you need to encounter that valve, certainly is. The interesting notion of Carlos and Billy on Fitz and Sample persist in transit are no, another story about moving between modes of responding. And when, when you're on it, you see where this rate comes from? Well, it's just bending time. Response rate within a band is a way of telling us how long the act is going to take. We did not get persistence when we had prior initiations. That was a, because we could forget Mark Riley and, and other students uh, with me. Uh, we were able to predict transition, able to predict probabilities, type of stimulus, and low payoff scenario very effectively as a markup process, which does not have memory. So it does not have persistence. It really does. So you don't, you don't get it in the trial initiation. So strength is all about transitions. Uh, if you raise the plane state or respond to this there, if you resist the state and that could be choice between the states in addition to the first time. Um, once you're in about response rates relatively invariant, most of the Changes to get a response rate or moving into an out without responding. So that entails that much of the action prior to distribution is in the other. Right about me and Diane talked about uh, competition between momentum and approach, uh, with traditional Pavlovian conditioning taking the direct and competitive system and the instrumental behavior going to a motivational peak uh, and other systems in there. Um, so what we have is that when you're in one of these modules, once you get, not necessarily when you're responding, but when you're in the module, uh, if you pause for breath, it's got momentum in the module. You get an opportunity to transit to a lower module, that's a good person. But you might even actually stay in a module longer than you need to before. I don't know if any of you have seen animals, pigeons in my case, pecking the key and when the horse comes out, and they've eaten from that up for hundreds of times, but they'll keep pecking the key. Rats will run over piles of food in an alley uh, to get the files to put the use together. Neither has one energy. Oh, an interesting thing about it, again, anticipated by Val and um, is that what you might see on this data gives the value. Not all of the things, even if you can't do all the things at once, that the options a place gives you some. It may be some additive to some. Uh, Charlie Candy showed that his amazing work on preference for freedom. Tiger Hanley Hernandez replicated it uh, with kids. Eric Trico and my lab has replicated it. Uh, so that, and, and Giacomo Casanova once said, one of my greatest pleasures in life is uh, waking from the dark room and looking through a window upon which stretches a vast horizon. We well, you know you can only take one of these paths, but it's really cool to have the options to choose which one of those paths are. This is another factoid about the law of effect of the learning. Okay, last chapter. What's happening from the view of this? Well, we have to know how to behave. We have to know what to do, not what a thing is. And after that tells us how to behave towards the stimulus. How to avoid the system. A popular model of emotional states don't even merit less for the um, major emotions. Uh, stress, nervous, upset, and present like the When you think about them, they're really all telling us either avoid things over here or approach these or don't do anything right now, just keep doing what you're doing. Affect is about telling us the complex situations which we adopt or not to adopt, take our hours out of the order. Now, a lot of these behaviors that we see actually, a lot of the affects can be conditioned. We see such a conditional fatigue. Uh, Paul Ross has talked a lot about conditional disgust. We know fear and anger can easily be conditioned. 
happening. So all of these different affects are things that are conditional. Uh, the old Wagner Aesop model is a great model. It's too complicated for people to use it. But it's all about the chief affect. It's too Kavanagh argued that the reason pleasure or affect is so important, it gives, because it is a universal common currency, should I go to the movies or go shoot pool or go study homework? You can evaluate those in terms of the common common thing of which is going to give the most pleasure now or in the future. A number of people did push out a nice PBS article a couple of years ago uh, on emulation theory of representation that whenever we're doing things, we're running neural circuits that are saying, oh, okay, he's walking over here, he's putting his hand up, he's turning around, and uh, resting, and all that feels pretty good. And that these help monitor what we're doing. So in case I put my hand here and miss, we'll say, oh, that's not fitting the model very well. Better watch what you're doing. And it can be run offline. And the nice thing about running these models offline is that you can generate scenarios. Like, should I go to the squad tutorial today? That could be sort of fun. Or maybe I should go and have a smoke or have a beer and talk with other people. Let me put them out and not down the road. We make plans. You find out where the tutorial room is, and you decide, OK, we've got a couple of concurrent sessions. Which one of these is going to give me the most pleasure? And that establishes this gradient for you that you will pursue. Consciousness is about re-engaging those most reliable effectors and sensors that we used when seeing, hearing, and doing, and taking them offline, but using them again to say, OK, if I were to go there, I would really make you feel it better. So affect is a really important concurrent of this flow of the track. So this is my last slide. You have to agree. You can't disagree with any of those. But nothing there is really new. It's just a little bit, I don't know, putting a few things together you don't want to I'm done. Towards 
first approach is not, at least in that one study, is not conditional. I think it's coming at the same thing. So you, um, you can like certain things, but not be able to engage instrumental responses for them. Uh, wanting will get you there. I've forgotten about the new ones. It's an important paper, and I don't, I can't get a good answer to your question. Well, wanting also gets you into a situation, it's part of the journey, but you may find yourself in a situation that you don't want. <laughs> yes. Is it carried through because of the momentum, or? or you know, that's, a good, that's exactly what Dickinson and Valine were talking about uh, the other morning. Uh, animals, where you, you value the outcome, uh, and they have to perform an offering to change to get to it, well, even though they no longer like that food because it makes them sick, that won't be clear until they get there. They will work hard to get it, and then they'll find, shoot, what did I do this for? I didn't need it. Or I work with the satiation, more than early work on running through. So I think maybe that's part of the, the story also. Thank you for that clue. Michael, excited to be I think you've been talking mostly about pulls, but there's pushes as well, yeah. in the sense that the terrain um, that you're moving over may have different uh, kinds of, of hills or valleys. So there's a sense in which the terrain can pull you down towards something that you don't want to be pulled down. Oh, yeah. And you see this so much. This is what self control is all about. You know? Oh, I shouldn't do it again, but it looks so good. You know? And can't control the implications. Yeah, it's a, uh, who is it uh, talking about Polaroids, uh, the notion of landscape, uh, of genetic landscape? That it's a landscape where it's quite clear you want to get there. There's this little ravine in the way, the eight-year-old uh, fence. <coughs> and it funnels huge amounts of behavior. And even though we can see where we want to go, we can't necessarily engage in the human problem. How do you go away from that thing that you like? And so you have lawyers from being corrupted doing things you want. Even if you're trivial, once you start timing your shoelace, you don't want people pestering with a few bit of time. And you also have other annoyances that are associated with pain, hunger, uh, illness that you want to avoid. So it's a, it's a lovely, it's a lovely path for this central state. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, of course, there's not much here to disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, good. But I, I also. You don't think you hear him say that? <laughs> I'm so happy. Go ahead. No, but I, I, but I think there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my belief in really is restored. Come on. Yeah. I, I don't think you can. De I, I think it's wonderful to, to try to synthesize like this. I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic. But I don't think that uh, it's possible to, to think about this in a. Uh, in a, a uh, what should I say, really productive manner without putting it into the context of the theory of evolution. I agree. And, uh, and I... You I have another, you another hour once mentioned. <laughs> what? No, I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, that I, so I think it would be great to take this, yeah. this framework that you're working toward and and see uh, how it um, coordinates with uh, the I, I, You know, I, it, it took me a while, obviously, I said I was writing this as a paper to clarify ideas, and it took me a while to get this far uh, to convince myself that this is probably the way things are, at least as far as I can see now. And you're right, the next thing, there are a number of ways to test it. One is data always, but another one is, uh, does it make sense in the context that we have a lot of faith in this? Context, how might that evolutionary contact have generated some of the behavioral fences and uh, bridges that we have or don't have? You know, a hyperbolic discount, where does that come into? How does that make sense in this framework? So, absolutely right. It, nothing makes sense outside of the normal context, really, except, you know, let's just sort of get organized at this level and pull it together. I'm giving a talk on that. Oh, one of my slides? <laughs> Please, somebody disagree with me, Billy. I was really bracing, but it didn't happen. I have a question. All right, Ron. How would I know that this was wrong? Oh, I mean, you said it's all obvious, but, 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 but you know, how would I know that, that something that was wrong? When I was a graduate student, I once asked that question of another graduate student who was a 
course, I was a bodybuilding instead. And he, he said, oh, it's not. We don't have to know. We don't have to test it. It's right. Here it is. <laughs> but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> uh, we can know it's wrong, but we know already that many of the things I'll suggest are unlikely to show it's wrong. For instance, animals preferring lower rates of reinforcement over higher rates of reinforcement. Animals are finding it easier to condition animals to move away from sources of food rather than move towards sources. Finding it easier to train animals for points that are higher in their behavioral hierarchy uh, to move it from those, to, to give up chewing something so that they can put it down to learn to ingest more of the same. That's not going to happen. Um, so this is sort of ca encapsulating a lot of things we already know. And so if we were to do this with these student experiments, thank God for science and experiments that tells us many ideas are stupid. But I think many of them would uh, bounce off of this one. But it's a very good question, Ron. How do we know if it's wrong? Um, a lot of the details are not right yet. You know, the momentum story is a lot of out. Um, a lot of details that are, are sketchy here you know, that, that we'll have to tweak. Well, it's just that you were asking for criticism, and I thought, was it nice I, had the, I had that help. Yeah. You did a good job. <laughs> Can anybody else do a good job like Ron? I'll play up a game of flipping coins with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do want to say, that there are a number of concepts like momentum and like all oh, oh, Billy's ideas I didn't think much of when I first read them. And now I realize he was way ahead of me and uh, maybe much of his other audience. And uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot of my story is just being discovered in his story. Thanks again.